welcome to the show. As we promised today, we have a special guest on the show, Bronia, my very good friend. We're going to be talking a lot more about separation, divorce, a whole lot more. So sit back and enjoy and also get some more experience about this wonderful, beautiful lady who has a lot to share with us. Hello, Bronia. How are you doing today? I'm great, Chris. Thanks so much for having me. Love the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on board. So, Grunia, let's talk about yourself. Let's get to meet you first, and then we can go into a whole lot of stuff that I want to talk about, like I just mentioned to my viewers. So let's get to meet you. Okay. Well, what do you want to know? My tagline is generally Grunia Kane, social scientist, well-being educator, and separated mom of five. So I use wow. that to kind of capture my personal and professional mix. Awesome. Awesome. Straight to the point. And I like that. So, uh, Grunia, uh, one of the big issues yet to, to, today, uh, when we talk about separation, the, the divorce, it's a very, very strong issue in most homes today. And these are not just only affecting uh, just families as to adults, but children who are, who are experiencing this in this process. So, from your experience as a mother, uh, can you tell us in your own story, um, not into more details, but give us some highlight about your own story, and then we can walk into our uh, areas of what I've just said. Sure. Uh, I was with my partner for 22 years. We were married for over 14 years. We had five children. They're now um, ranging between the ages of nine and 17 of a daughter and four sons. And I suppose the key question that people ask is like, oh, where did it all go wrong? And it's not any one particular thing. It's kind of a, a crumbling over time. And mm. I suppose what I share in my podcast a lot is really for us to be honest around our own self-awareness. So there was a lot that I didn't know my 22, 23 year old self when I was coupling. And all I could really think about was marriage and children. Like that's, I just wanted more than anything to be a parent. And luckily, I got to fulfill that, which is fantastic. And I really enjoy being a parent. And I enjoyed being married and I enjoyed relationships. And my children's father is a lovely man and he's a good father. But it was just not the right fit. We weren't growing together. We didn't um, have the same values. We certainly didn't parent from the same paradigm or practice at all. And we had this kind of pattern unhealthy pattern and cycle kind of every two years where he'd be in and out of employment and then he would be unhappy and there was all sorts of kind of undercurrents in just our general daily living though the surface of things looked great we had two cars we had a nice home we had holidays twice a year our children looked good and we were very lucky they're all very healthy and average mm -hmm. people so everything looks fine but it's just this veneer and this year I was kind of living this expectation that everybody had of me and as a mother you kind of feel like a bit of a martyr anyway but I was just so empty and lost and really came to the decision um one day that I was like a, nearly like a bolt of lightning that I just I cannot do this anymore for me for him for the children it just wasn't a thriving home nothing could grow in it it nearly becomes like this rotten cancer that just kind of invades and infects your home to the point that if you look back and you'll see other people around you like if their houses are deteriorating it really is a bit symbolic of what's happening on the inside as well and our house was like just beginning to fall apart I didn't even notice it until we separated and he moved out I was like oh my god I have to fix everything yeah. um so you're fixing the physical as well as the emotional and the internal as well. So I suppose that was kind of my inspiration that there is people focus on the process and the separation and the marital breakdown or the long-term relationship breakdown, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, and the process that I was going through and his reaction and his process. So the stages of grief are like anger, denial, depression, negotiation and acceptance. And us as parents were going through that at different stages at different times but equally our children then months later get the news and the information and they're going through that and cognitively they can't process what has happened preceding the actual breakup and then all the changes and uncertainty that comes with that and that's this very focused time yeah. but then it's an ongoing life of uncertainty really because 
I suppose dad moves out, I'm the resident parent and he's the non-resident parent. You've got all sorts of change in arrangements. He moved in with uh, a person, a room in a house, a friend of his first, then he moved somewhere else, then he's moved in with a partner. So your children are constantly dealing with changes in new friendships, new relationships, um, how to share with school and friends that their parents, parents are separated. Yeah. yeah. So that's the point I want to come in, you know, and, and, I, and I'm so proud of you that you didn't even hold back to, um, you know, say, oh, I want to say this, I want to say that, I want to say this, because what you're going through, yes, other people are going through the same. It's just different people with different aspects of how you see them, you know, how you go through them. But here is the thing I want to ask you, and it's a general question I've done on my show is, why do, I mean, from the start, you said everything was fine, but along the road, things get to change, you know, which is normal. Yeah. Totally. But because kids are involved in this process, it's not, is there not a way that parents could really look into the area of the kids? Because you are adults, or we are all adults, because uh, I have to include myself into it. Um, but the kids are the most important area of this. They are friends, they have schools, uh, they have other activities and routine they've been to as to mom is there, dad is there. All of a sudden, one of them is going to go off, you know, and they have to live with that. Yeah. How, how does that really impact kids? And how do you see it as a mother yourself? Yeah. So I suppose I get the joy of seeing it, but luckily, professionally and personally. Um, yeah. And I, I totally agree with you. Like lot, nobody really goes and leaves a long-term relationship with kids lightly because I suppose culturally as well in Ireland, it's really like, oh, you know, families should stay together. And lots of people, and I have lots of friends and peers who stay together for the children. Uh, yeah. And there's merit in that if you can. But also children pick up on if you're just staying together for the children. So yeah. I think there is things that parents can do and be proactive to reconnect and, and actually have he happy, healthy marriages or relationships. Mm -hmm. But the impact that you asked on the children is, you know, the research shows it's, an, it's what's called an ACE, an adverse childhood experience, yeah. of which there is many. But the top eight include all the abuses like sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, neglect a child of a parent in incarceration, a child of a domestic violence, a child of mental illness, and children of parental separation, separation or divorce, is up there as an adverse childhood experience. So it has a huge psychological effect on a child. Um, and I think the great example that I'll draw upon, Chris, I was watching your show with Donna, and she talked about how her experience as a seven-year-old child, I know she was talking about sexual abuse, but she talks about how a seven-year-old child cannot understand what has happened to them and, and why and, and what they did for it to happen. So mm. it's really the same cognitively for children of parental separation because they're completely myopic. So they're always going to interpret everything as, uh, what did I do wrong? What, how is this my fault? How can I fix it? They become parentified because they're trying to keep both parents happy. They feel sometimes that their parents' happiness then is all their responsibility. Sure. They're of greater risk then of like substance misuse, promiscuity, lower educational performance because their focus has been altered. Or yeah. Disturbances. So yeah, and financially, uh, less would go to third level because there's financial strain as well. Yeah, because. The reason I'm still more on the kids' side because at the end of the day, I feel like adults can they, they can manage them themselves. And before they have kids, um, they'll be very good. It's just when kids came in, things start to change. And I just feel like it's more heavier on the kids. And also, 99.9% uh, is always the mothers who always have the kids. Mm -hmm. uh, the father are not going to be there. Maybe they will come in maybe twice or once or three times a month, depends on how it's been arranged. Uh, you as the mother, um, do you not feel like there's a whole lot of more load on you? On one side, yes, you have the freedom because you're not with him anymore. But on the other hand, you have a lot of responsibility knowing when a child is sick, 
uh, the school activities, clothes, food, all of these things, do you not consider that as a way, way body on you? That is the million dollar question, Chris, because that I think is uh, on the pulse. That's what irates everybody and there's huge resentment as a result of it. So you have the resident parent and the non-resident parent. So in my case, I'm the resident parent. Their father, um, from a maintenance point of view and a child custody point of view, so he will have them every second weekend and every Tuesday for two hours a week. And that's kind of fairly bog standard judicial separation stuff. Yeah. Um, and maintenance then is done according to the father, we'll say in this case, um, excess income, right? So he, the courts will take into account what he needs to provide for himself. Mm -hmm. And if there's disposable income there, then a percentage of that can be awarded as child maintenance. Yeah. So that means you can get 20 euro a week or you could get 10 pounds, like a thousand a week or whatever. It just depends. Whereas in other countries, it's like, actually, if you have a child, you have a responsibility to pay $350 per month per child that you have. You have to go and work hmm. and provide for your child. So maintenance is a big bone of contention throughout. And yes, that does mean then as a result, um, the resident parents. So in my case, my um, children's father didn't pay maintenance for 18 months and um, then did pay 100 euro a month for five children. And really I have to bring them to court to kind of go through family court to get them to pay uh, maintenance. Now he does provide 50% of education and healthcare, but it's a real bone of contention because you have two things. One is, as you said, you've the 24 seven responsibility, all exactly. the runs to and from school, all the training, the feeds, yep. the bus, the, the, the pure, the tantrums, it's all targeted at you. You're the one dealing with the transition from visiting dad or new relationships. And that's all targeted at you because you're the resident parent. So you have that strain all the time. And mm. there is like a financial burden because if your child needs braces or something like that, dad might go, no, you still have to cough it up. The child yeah. still needs it. So yeah. yeah, there is, it's a real bone of contention and it can cause a lot of resentment. And yeah. in and out of court is expensive, but it keeps the couple that has separated in a constant place of conflict you see so that is the that is the old part of this conversation and i'm glad that you seem more open in in really saying this and i really hope that uh people out there both men and women will really listen to this conversation and really find ways to really you know avoid this this you know this road it is it is not easy road you know um the thing Back to another question I want to really talk to you about is that what about the men? Um, because we're talking about women, women, women. We know, yes, some men are still going through what women go through, even though they don't have access to have these kids in full well. Either they've been abused, you know, or different areas. Um, what about men who are going through divorce process against women? When women know that, okay, um, you know, I have more leverage than that this man. I want to punish him. I don't want to be with him or whichever way. Yeah. How do we put men in this kind of, you know, box? Yeah. I think it's it's a huge area, Chris, and I'm delighted you brought it up because there's two things that I think people need to be very aware of. Like one, men don't want to leave their children. Like there's this assumption that, oh, men have a grave and they get to, you know, just have their kids every second weekend and it's easy peasy. It's very sad for them. They are missing out and their children many of them are homeless many of them like you know when they're leaving the family home like where do they go so mm. um and it impacts their employment as well so there is a lot of logistics and it's a huge adjustment for them and a huge identity change yeah um, I, I i i really think um that area you know needs to be really looked into a lot more for men you know because um, I'm not saying because I'm a man, oh yeah, I'm taking the advantage of it, but there are two, right. you know, there are two equations here, you know, um, mm -hmm. there are men who are crying, but it's just that they can't cry out as to the way women will come out and be confident to say, hey, this is the problem, but it then falls back to the kids as well, you know, like you rightly mentioned, go on. Yeah. Well, like hugely because our children miss out on male role models. Like mm. my children, for example, have four boys and a girl. Wow. Um, all of them need a male role model. I don't have 
uncles or granddads nearby or anything like that like they don't they have you know football coaches and instructors for different things that they have relationships with but they end up then being their male role models and so I think we have a real gap then in masculinities both for men and women at a societal level because you know in primary school they only really have female teachers so where are they where are they landing their male role models what are they seeing what are they picking up on what do they learn about relationships Mm. and the other piece Chris just to get back to your previous question about men and how there's this very generic kind of the mother becomes the resident parent uh, which you know is the majority that's not everybody um but it can really lead to what's called parental alienation which we have huge numbers on the rise here so Mm. you can really um cut a father out of a child's life Mm. and that is never in the best interest of the child true safety safety issues aside but you know i do think there's ways i've spoken to schools about it that Actually, when a parent separates, rather than just communicating with one parent, a school should automatically communicate with both parents Mm. to sustain both parents' involvement in a child's education. Like there's some administrative things that could be done very easily. Mm. Well done to you, Grania. I mean, you really put a lot of points in, and, I, and I believe a lot of people will really sit back to really hear more of this, you know. Now, I want to come back to, to the work you, you do, which is amazing work. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff when you're talking about issue regarding separation and the divorce. From your experience, being expertise in this area, how best do you, do you reach out to, to uh, people in separation, in divorce process, uh, better ways to go, uh, better ways to avoid it? Because you've been there. And most people who tell the story are people who have experienced it, will know what they went through and become that person in a very positive light so how do you how do you help out in these areas yeah so i suppose there's lots of services in the country both locally and nationally but those services are um really uh, they're under resourced and so they're predominantly only available for people who are either very very high risk or when the wheels have come off like there's Mm. drastic situation in place so generally what i say to people is There's no universal template for separation, but it is to have a long term and short term concrete plan to get an agreement in place as soon as possible to Mm. reduce the conflict because that conflict just infects and is toxic and it spills out to your kids Um, Mm. have a parenting plan like know your parenting values. So if you I would always say to parents, do you want to be at your child's graduation or the birth of their child or whatever it is. Because right now you're fighting over like nonsense kind of stuff. The ultimate aim is to have a connection and a quality relationship with your child. You're always going to be parents. You Mm -hmm. may think you're going to baffle them. They have to be here at this time and here at that time. But the child's going to become an adult and is going to want both their parents at their birthdays or whatever it is. Um, And the, the parent has to try and push. So at an emotional level, you'd be trying to help somebody to go how can you both be right you have to accept that that other parent is different than you that's why you separated so everybody says like oh that their ex is a narcissist and there's a like six percent of the population have a narcissistic personality disorder but Mm. really most people when they're separating we're all narcissistic and show Mm. traits of narcissism that doesn't mean that they're a narcissist you're at your absolute worst yeah but you have to allow that that person is ultimately the parent of your children and you Mm. need to see the best in them so i would always encourage people to go what good qualities what good things do they do that you can talk positively to your children about so for example my ex-husband is like a huge sports fanatic he loves football he's a diehard man united fan It wasn't great for the marriage, but from a parenting point of view, I can step into that and go, oh my God, you should definitely ask your dad about that. He'll And he'll be at every game. You know, he's 200% committed when football's involved. So you should embrace that as a strength. Yeah. I have this question I want to ask you there. We should just make sure something else. So help me understand this. This is me being very honest with you. Okay. How do we then define a better relationship or a better marriage? or when we don't know what's on the other side of the tunnel how do we yeah oh yeah so 
Um, so how do we, when we're in relationships, yeah. prepare? Yeah, yeah. How do we, yes. As to, yeah. How do we know what is a better marriage? As to, yeah. Um, yeah. So a couple that is honest, has good communication, can allow the other person to be validated and accepted in themselves. So it's not, so you're not invalidating the other person for their hopes, dreams, wishes, or intentions. Mm. Um, and if the other partner is interested in growing, mm. because if a couple comes together and the one person stays static and the other person grows, then you're going to you're going to inevitably separate. So especially with parenting, if if people are committed to parenting, mm. then um, you have to grow. You grow with your children. You grow as a parent. You parent your second child differently than your parent your first child because you'll have learned so much. Yeah. And I think it's really important. Like so, what I would say to my children in terms of relationships because they'd be high risk for troubled relationships and breaking down relationships and promiscuity is yeah. you know really take a look at the person like neurologically and hormonally a lot happens when we fall in love with somebody like uh, we just did a podcast with um audrey casey from sex therapy solutions for parents like who are yeah. separated who are dating in relationships and, mm -hmm. and so you don't want to make the same mistake again so it's really looking at being very aware of yourself and what you like, what makes you feel physically safe, what makes you feel emotionally safe, what, what is it that you enjoy doing. And you don't have to have that person in your life for absolutely everything. But honesty, communication, best friends, chemistry, that's kind of the core four ingredients to a healthy relationship. And I always say to my kids, have a look around, see how they treat people around them. Mm -hmm. So see how they treat their mother like that be obviously for Mike it's like are you good to their mother are you good to your mother like so just, it, there's some benchmarks if you're really looking and maybe not look at the person that you're after falling wildly in love with kind of test yourself and and look at your friends and look at other relationships so that's what I would do with my kids the whole time be like so what kind of marriage or what kind of relationship do you do you like and they'll be able to say like, well, I don't, I don't really think they have a very good, I don't like what they've got going on, but I like how they treat each other. Great. What is it that you like? Well, I like that he'll always, you know, walk her on the inside or he's always like attending to her or she's always listening to him or when they're talking, they're making eye contact. Like it's really looking at what, what are the nuances? What are Chemistry. the signs yes. to you? Yeah. 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 Well, that is the thing before we wrap, wrap things up, because this is a very interesting, uh, you know, a topic that we're talking about because it's our everyday life and which is true, yeah. you know, but yeah. my only concern is that, um, I said love is blind, which is true. And everything you're saying is 100% right there. But the fact is when you're in love, one, you don't have the time to do all this investigation. Um, okay. Love so, is blind. Yeah. So my question here is, when we talk about relationship, when you're in love, uh, you don't really have the time to really investigate most of those things because they say love is blind, and which is true, yeah. love is blind. So my question here is, if we have to wait to go through all these process, how much time do we have to put in all of this? And do you not think that this might be too much for one to go through? Uh, do you not think that going through this process, it takes a lot and the other party would think probably you're doing too much. And the, on the other hand as well is um, people have two ways of life. They pretend you never know what they will be down the road as well until you get into it and then realize a lot of things aren't what you saw at the very beginning. So what is your take in around all of this? Yeah, no, love is blind. I mean, chemically, you know, when you're, you know, fancy somebody or you're getting to know somebody and it's exciting and you're oxytocin and endorphins kicking off and that yeah. is, that is the love hormones and so and you become addicted to that and at the other end you'll see when relationships break up even early on that heartbreak it is a bit like withdrawal from cocaine or addiction you know mm. it's the same kind of processes that happen so yeah so people have to mind their hearts a bit for sure 
um, and there isn't the time for the investigation. But the reality is that initial, like it's commonly known as the honeymoon period because, mm. you know, that, that part of the brain has shut down because love is blind. But you can tune into it. So I kind of talk about you've got the emotional system and the reflective system. Mm -hmm. And the reflective system is when you're like writing a shopping list or planning your work for the show. Like that's what's kicked in. And mm. um, when you're physically not with that person, you can really tap into your reflective system. True. So, you know, th there is ways of, of doing it. Mm. You know, if you're with somebody the whole time, but you do want to be, um, but it is to take a little bit of time for yourself. That's why, you know, people are saying like, stay in touch with your friends, not to cut everybody out. True. You know, take a little bit of time for yourself and think about, you know, what direction this is going in. And ultimately, I think the key question is, how does that person make you feel about yourself? Mm. Are they helping you build you up? Or do you just feel good because they feel good? Like, are yeah. you feeding them? Yeah. Very, very, very precise point you really make there, Agrena. Before you go, um, we'll talk about this very part you just mentioned there. Do, are they helping you or are they just, you know, putting you on the other side? So my question there would be, if you are in a relationship and you feel you're being abused a lot more yeah. and then, you know, sometimes it, it could be the men who are abusing the woman a lot more, there could be drink issue, there could be all the different kind of issues. Mm -hmm. What should happen in a relationship like that? I know people will say seek counseling, seek all the different support. And sometimes too, from what I've you know, seen, yes, they get the support and everything, all is good, and they still go back in again. So from your expertise, how would you be able to advise people for this kind of stuff? Yeah. That's a really good question. So whether it's abuse or addiction, so that addiction can be screen time, yep. sex addiction, gambling, mm -hmm. any kind of drugs, prescription medication, whatever, or any of the verbal, emotional, or physical or sexual abuses. Um, I suppose the advice is, first and foremost, safety of you and your children is of priority. Sure. Um, but is there a way through? Absolutely, 100% there is a way through. Mm. If both parties want to step into recovery. So quite often what will happen is um, the person with the addiction or the person with the violent emotions, they might go and get help. Mm. But if the other party doesn't go and get help, you're still triggering and you know, you're, you're doing a common pattern this way and they've, they've changed their pattern. So mm. everybody in the family actually has to go into recovery mm. and do the work to build a better form of communication, healthier relationships. So everybody has to do individual work and then yeah. coupled work. Wonderful. Even couples therapy, there sh it should has to be individual work and yeah. couple work. You can't do it just coupled. Just coupled. So which means because yeah. everyone after that time is going through that the same uh, set of circumstances. So therefore everyone has to go in uh, it's a whole lot of work isn't it it is but it's it, uh, what i always say to people is it's actually uh, it's an investment it saves time saves stress saves saves heartache if you put a little bit of time into um, investing in yourself and how you what you are responsible for and how you are accountable to other people around you then you've you've saved everything You've saved all the disasters that could happen down the road. Yeah. And what about the, the divorce uh, uh, proceedings? Um, do you think of, I know recently they've changed. I don't know if it, if it has come to effect now, but there, there is that long length. And now I think it's about three years or so. Um, do you think, should, should parents try as much to avoid going through that? And... And, and be able to fix things if possible? Um, no, is my short answer. So <laughs> in, yeah, so in 1996, I mean, the, the judicial papers, and, I, and I, I wouldn't be an expert in this area, but uh, they were drafted in 1986. So the whole mm -hmm. point in Ireland was like, we have separation, 
and then divorce because it's to allow a cooling off period so that marriages can come back together. And mm. um, they have they don't have that legally in other countries, but it happens, you know, so couples take a break. They don't have to fire into a legal system right away. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy or always financially viable to do. I mean, there's lots of couples who've broken up, not just during COVID, but even prior to COVID. And they're still living together because housing is, is out of scarcity. Yeah. Yeah. So now I think it's um, my personal experience and for the people that I've talked to on the podcast or that I've worked with, no, it's, it's a financial nightmare to have to go through and an emotional nightmare to go through the judicial separation. Yeah. And then, which can cost like up to 15,000 and yeah. then yeah. start again and go yeah. through mm. divorce, um, which is now two and a half years later. So that's what I'm in the process of the moment. Yeah. Um, divorce started at 2017, separation started at 2017 and 20, um, then in the May, nine months later, we had the judicial agreement. And now with courts and all that sort of stuff, you have to go through it all again. And it actually brings you into toxicity again because you're kind of arguing again, even yeah. though you're going, we have to go through the sisters. And then you've all the cost of that again, which is money taken away from your children. It's a whole lot. Day. Yeah, it is yeah. a lot. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. Grania, yeah. before you go, you have your own podcast. What's the name of your podcast and what day of the week or how do you run, run it? It's Divorce or Separated Parenting Podcast and there's two episodes a week, usually Mondays and Wednesdays. Okay. Yeah, on all the usual platforms. Perfect, perfect. Okay, Grania, thank you so, so much for sharing your thoughts with us today. I believe most women and men also are there would be inspired by all you've shared on this show. And also, please go out there and listen to our podcast. We will actually put that information on our website and also on the show for viewers to uh, see more information. But thank you so much, girl. You're rocking. You're very strong. You're brave. And I like your confidence that you don't just hold back. You just go out there, say exactly how it is, and that's how it is. And you're moving on, and you're happy, and so be it. Thank you so much for coming on the show, and we wish you best of luck. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me. Great. You're welcome. Yeah, still it does it. Okay, viewers at home, this is where we're going to wrap things up. We want to say thank you for tuning in. Make sure you catch up with Gronia. She has a lot of stuff that you can read and look up. We'll put our information on our website. And also, join us every week on the Jerry Quest show as we have a lot of more stuff coming up. Take care. I'll see you next week. God bless. Bye. All right, welcome back. Welcome back. Well, this is all we have for you today. Thank you to my two wonderful guests who are joining me on the show today. First, I want to say thank you to Maria, and also I want to thank you. I want to say thank you to Gronio for all both of you to be part of the show. You are very inspirational, and keep doing what you do best. We have viewers at home. I know we're running out of time, but here's the good news: you can watch the rest of the pro program on my YouTube channel. So go in and see the full entire interview on our YouTube channel would be at J Request Show. So follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and also on Instagram. Check out a lot of stuff that we have coming your way. And if you want to advertise or sponsor part of what we do on the show, please do get in touch at, at marketing at jrequestshow.com. See I come your way next week. Take care and God bless. Bye for now. See you soon. <laughs>